Good morning. Um, happy to be here. I wanted to thank Michelle uh, from FOMA for inviting me to speak today. And in particular, I wanted to thank Marie McPherson for sponsoring this uh, talk. She is the uh, director of the uh, Florida Center for Behavioral Health. And uh, I'd encourage all of you to stop by their table on your way out today. They have uh, all sorts of very interesting literature around uh, Florida practice guidelines for uh, psychotropic medication that I think you'd find really helpful in terms of your practice. So you might want to do that. Um, okay, we'll start out I'm, uh, with a video. I'm Ross Geller, Dr. Ross Geller. <laughs> Dad, please. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Um, I'm Dr. Ross Geller. <laughs> Phoebe, there is no secret, okay? I didn't propose. Are you lying? Is this like that time you tried to convince us you were a doctor? <laughs> I am a doctor. <laughs> so, um, I'll go right on to disclosures. I have nothing relevant, but Really, I don't like it uh, when speakers say they have nothing relevant. I think it's important for you to determine what's relevant. And here you can see my professional income. 90% of it comes from uh, income generated from Centene Corporation, which is a for-profit health plan that's across the country here. We serve 23 million Americans with Medicaid, Medicare, and uh, exchange uh, programs. And 10% of my income comes from a stipend from uh, NOVA for teaching medical students. And I have some stock through the Centene Employee Stock Purchase Plan and uh, one stock of a pharmaceutical company. So there, now you can make a decision whether my uh, influences are relevant to this conversation or not. Uh, so I, my background is uh, I've been in a physician for 46 years. I graduated from MSU COM. I was in practice for 27 years in community psychiatry. And for the past 17 years now, I've been with WellCare, which is now Centene. And I've, I've been a market medical director uh, for uh, Centene in the Florida market. And uh, I've been in the pharmacy division for many years uh, doing utilization review of pharmacy. So when you send a prescription in, uh, and it's not part of the uh, uh, preferred drug list, then I end up reviewing it and uh, reviewing the prior authorization requirements and so on. I've also been involved in teaching uh, NOVA uh, students at the Patel School in Clearwater, and uh, I've worked closely with Ken Johnson, the associate dean there, to develop uh, clerkships in psychiatry with five of our biggest mental health centers. Uh, I'm on the MSU COM admissions team, and uh, it's been fun to uh, meet these prospective students that are applying to Michigan State for uh, DO school. And it's both these activities, both the uh, Patel School and MSU COM, that kind of um, motivated me to uh, put this slide deck together and maybe to share it with you to get your uh, thoughts on it. Um, after 46 years in practice, uh, you can get rather cynical, and it's been a refreshing, invigorating experience to work with these students, both at Patel and, and to meet these students that are applying for medical school. And it made me really think about what is it they're going to enter into? What kind of experience are they gonna have as physicians uh, in the next 20, 30 years? And I wrote an essay on, on this, and it was in the FOMA magazine called Whatever Happened to Marcus Welby. And uh, I don't know if you saw it or not, but, but it's kind of my experience. Uh, and so I have had personal medical experience, really, that I'm going to share with you as well. Um, during this past five years in particular, I was healthy up until five years ago, and uh, I had some medical problems, and I'm going to share those with you as we go through this slide a little bit. So Marcus Welby was a esteemed doctor right on TV for, I think, 10 years. And 
he was beloved by all of his patients and he was part of the community and he made house calls and he went to the hospital and he had a younger partner that he mentored and he was what we idealized the physician to be, right? And, and some of us that are older in the audience, we, we remember these, these days and the way practice was back then and how it is now. When I first started in practice back in 1980, it was like there was no managed care whatsoever and you were free to admit and discharge patients as you see, saw fit, right? And it's changed quite a bit since that time. So reflecting on our osteopathic profession over 46 years, what, what, what's happened to our profession? Uh, th those videos that you saw are, are examples. Many of us remember when we first uh, went into DO school, people ask you, what is a DO? Aren't they like chiropractors or something? Or, or are they like orthopedic surgeons? Can they prescribe medicines? Well, we've come a long way from there, haven't we? We have universal acceptance of our credentials by all the states, by all the hospitals across the country. There's no questioning about what DOs are now. We've grown to over 146,000 DOs in 50 states, 38,000 DO students, a 30% increase in the past five years. 25% of all medical students now go to a DO school. And in 2023, more than half of all DOs will become primary care physicians or internal medicine or pediatricians, which is really remarkable. Uh, the majority of DOs are under the age of 45, so it's a young profession and uh, uh, growing like crazy. What are the weaknesses of our profession? Well, all of the DO hospitals are gone. Most of us in my age bracket remember when we had DOH in Detroit, we had Botsford in Detroit, we had Grand Rapids Osteopathic, uh, we had Chicago Osteopathic, downtown Hyde Park, out in Olympia Fields, all of these hospitals are gone now. And somehow we miss the boat on becoming a corporate entity and having an HCA-like system of hospitals. Uh, our residency training programs have just recently been turned over to the ACGME. Uh, so what's gonna happen to our osteopathic philosophy, our osteopathic beliefs, principles, and so on, as we join with the allopathic profession in terms of our training programs. We had six colleges of osteopathic medicine when I was going to MSU, and now we have 40 colleges of osteopathic medicine. And how do we develop faculty with 40 new schools? I mean, it's a challenge, and we're gonna have to rise to the standards of the allopathic medical schools. And I remember at one time I was chairman of psychiatry at Chicago Osteopathic, and I was recruited to go there because I'm board certified by MD and DOs. And so I was proud to go down there and be a part of that. And we recruited four residents to start out. But those four residents, and, and, and I want to say that I had the chairman of Michigan State come to Chicago Osteopathic and take a tour and give us a report on what he thought we needed in terms of faculty development. And he said we needed 10 full-time psychiatrists. And we had three. So these four residents came to Chicago Osteopathic when we had three residents. And they could have gone down the street, three blocks, to the University of Chicago, where they had 23 residents, 23 faculty, full-time faculty. So our hot, our um, our uh, medical schools are going to have to really compete for students and meet the criteria that the allopathic medical schools set on some level. And I was just speaking with the dean of one of our medical schools uh, just recently, and he said some of the medical schools have a 30% decrease in applications. It's really the very first time that they've had decreases in applications. So there is some competition for these students now. And the AMA indicates it has over a million physicians, students, residents in its Rolodex, and 270,000 dues-paying members. So 
We are a minority still, even if we're a growing minority. So the threats are, are we seeing the demise of primary care in the United States? There's articles out all over the place suggesting that primary care is a specialty that's, you know, on the way out. And the competition in primary care from nurse practitioners and APRNs uh, who proved to be less costly in terms of hiring them. I know that I, in my role as market medical director uh, in Florida, I go to all the community mental health centers all over the state, and many of them are hiring nurse practitioners to do the medical part of the care of the patients. And if they can hire a nurse practitioner for half of what they hire a primary care physician for, you know, just like any other business, they're going to try to do the low-cost alternative. Will there be an oversupply or an undersupply of physicians in the years to come? Our associations say that there's a significant undersupply of doctors, but I'm not sure if that's the case. And most importantly, and I think this is the real challenge that we face as an osteopathic profession, is will DOs lose their unique identity and philosophy as they become part of ACGME? And ACGME takes over graduate medical education. And then what will AI have? What kind of impact will AI have on primary care? I was just talking with a dean of another medical school uh, the other day who said he really thinks it's going to help primary care, and I believe that's the case. Like in my own work in the pharmacy division of Centene, I do the reviews of all of the medications that come in that require a prior auth. All of my work will go away. Artificial intelligence will look at the script that you wrote. It'll look at the preferred drug list. It'll look at the prior auth requirements. It'll look at the best practices, and it'll tell the doctor which medication is the proper medication for that particular health plan. And it'll happen in a blink of an eye with one push of a button. So <clears throat> what are the opportunities for our profession? It's absolutely clear to me that DOs lead the way in primary care, that DOs can set the set the goals for primary care, and they can set the agenda for primary care. And primary care is important in our medical health system, and in a second I'll show you why. A little bit more about our osteopathic physicians. I'm so proud to share this with you that the US News and World Report said osteopathic medical schools took seven of the top 10 spots for graduating, graduates going into primary care. Three of the top 10 spots for graduates ultimately practicing in health profession shortage areas. Six of the top 10 spots for graduating and practicing in rural areas. Uh, but Florida DOs represent 10% of all practicing physicians, so we're still a significant minority. But DOs clearly are leading the way in meeting the needs of our state, federal, local governments to serve in areas that are underserved. And in my interviews with students at Michigan State that are applying for school, and many of them have only applied to DO schools. They haven't applied to MD schools. They believe in the osteopathic philosophy. They believe in what we're doing. And they said, Dr. Avid, I've only applied to DO schools because I believe in what's, what they what they believe in. So it's really inspiring to, to speak with these kids and how motivated they are. So the New England Journal of Medicine reported on a survey done by the Larry Green Center for Advancement of Primary Care for the Public Good in 2020, and over 8,100 primary care respondents described severe staff shortages, financial stress, difficulty providing accessible care, challenging, challenges regarding uh, telehealth, and this one I ca caught my eye, mental exhaustion due to growing patient burdens regarding mental health. The primary care physicians were getting burned out taking care of the mental health needs of their patients. And this was uh, 
And, and uh, uh, this was in part due to COVID, I think. The Plight of Primary Care, New England Journal of Medicine 2023 podcast, increasing number of doctors leaving the field, corporatization of primary care, time pressures, and the inability to form relationships that enable good care. You, you know, you have to see more patients in a day, 40, 50 patients in a day, and you get to spend five minutes with them. That is not enabling good patient care. The whole idea of patient primary care is to de develop that doctor-patient relationship that therapeutic alliance with the patient where you know the patient and their family and you can help them make decisions about their care because of the time you spend with them. So this is the problem in pr primary care. Medical economics in August of 2022, are primary care physicians being replaced? Increasing number of doctors leaving the field, more doctors reporting physician burnout, the aging of the patient population, increased morb morbidity and mortality because of COVID. And we see that even now, after post-COVID, people getting uh, sick as a result of COVID. The aging workforce, two of five physicians will be over 65 in the next decade. And the role of nurse practitioners and uh, uh, physician assistants 106,000 nurse practitioners in 2004, and now doubled like 355,000. Same with PAs, 89,000 in 2010, 159,000 now. And the average salary being $139,000, competing with primary care physicians in this space. So the Harvard Business Review had some uh, ideas for solutions to this, these issues. They said they believe we need to expand and improve primary care to achieve better health care outcomes. Uh, primary care involves broad, deep relationships that technology can't capture in a patient encounter. EMRs need to be more clinically focused rather than focused on billing, and that reform of the pay payment model is extremely important. America spends 50% less than other industrialized countries on primary care. So we all have to join together and advocate for improvement and reimbursement for physicians. And I can tell you, in terms of Centene's uh, relationship with primary care physicians, Centene is all about finding ways to reimburse physicians uh, to lower medical expense. And if you can come up with a, a, a program that lowers their overall medical expense, they will contract with you for it. Like anything that reduces readmissions to the hospital, like Centene is all about that. Financial incentives linked to higher value care, better patient experience, a lower cost total cost of care and longer life experience. I'll tell you my own personal experience. I went to, uh, uh, five years ago, I was getting really sick and I wasn't sure what was wrong with me. I went to see my primary care physician. She couldn't see me. Uh, she was taking care of her husband who had a medical problem himself. So that's understandable, right? And her partner was booked up taking care of all her patients. So I went to a GI doctor uh, because some of my symptoms seem to be like GI. And I called the office, they said, we can't see you for three months, but you can see our nurse practitioner. So I went in and saw the nurse practitioner. The nurse practitioner took my history and they did my vitals. Uh, my blood pressure was 150 over 110. And after the interview, she told me to get these labs and come back in two weeks. And no physical exam whatsoever, no physical exam, no repeat of my blood pressure. Later that evening, I got very sick and I went to the ER and it turns out I had BPH and I had hydronephrosis associated with BPH. And my creatinine was like through the roof. And three days later, I get a call from the nurse practitioner. She said, 
your labs are really bad. You better go straight to the hospital. I, I said, I'm in the hospital. So this was the kind of, you talk about patient experience. This was not a good patient experience for me. And when I, uh, uh, when I got in the hospital, actually the hospitalist was a DO and was marvelous, fabulous, did a great job, took good care of me. I would have preferred to see my family physician, but my family physician did not come into the hospital. They were totally outpatient, totally separated from inpatient care. So primary care is unique in healthcare. It cannot be managed the same way that other parts of healthcare can be managed, where the emphasis has rightly been on streamlining and cutting waste from a bloated system. At the heart of primary care remains the unique relationship between the doctor and the patient. And that is really hard to measure. And primary care is the only medical discipline where a greater supply produces improvements in population health, longer lives, and greater health equity. This is uh, from the National Academies of Science. No other specialty can claim this. So the more primary care physicians we have on the front end that are screening patients for all of these conditions and treating them early leads to decreases in medical expense. That's what our company wants to see is decreases in medical expense. The only group of specialists that can do that are primary care physicians. Success factors in primary care include the conversation, the doctor-patient relationship, that longitudinal relationship, that continuity of care over time, a whole person approach, and I can't tell you how important a whole person approach is. Now everybody is adopting our philosophy, that allopathic physicians are all adopting this biopsychosocial approach, which has been part of osteopathic medicine for 100 years. They're finally catching on. Uh, understanding the illness experience. It's more than just treating a disease. It's about how the patient copes with being sick. It's the illness experience, and osteopathic physicians are good at understanding the illness experience. When I interview these students for medical school for MSU, I sit, and many of them do scribing now, we didn't do this when we were applying to med school, but they do scribing for the doctors. They take the notes and they dictate the, the notes. I said, do you see any difference between DOs and MDs in terms of their notes? They said, oh yeah, they're totally different. DOs ask a lot more questions. They're asking questions about the family, about where you work, all of those things that are important. Whereas our allopathic colleagues are focused on the disease process per se. Um, this is, I'm telling you what the students pick up and what they identify when I interview them. So population health, we're all talking about population health, doesn't mean a GM assembly line approach. There's a difference between a GM assembly line and practicing medicine. The difference being this, the GM assembly line, every part is the same, right? They have uniform parts going down the assembly line. But when you have a patient going down that assembly line, every part is different for every single patient. Their heart's different, their mind is different, their social experience is different, their wallet, their pocketbook is different. So how can you have an assembly line approach when every item coming down the assembly line is different? That's the challenge that business people don't understand about the practice of medicine. And believe me, I'm surrounded by business people at Centene. So primary care is essential part of our healthcare system. Increases in the capacity funding support lead to improvements in population health at a lower cost. And, and it's, I'm proud to say, our osteopathic physicians are making a significant contribution to the primary care effort in increasing the number of doctors going into primary care. At least 50% of our docs go into primary care and leading efforts to serve people in underserved areas. 
Both are priorities for the federal and state governments, and the osteopathic is, is serving that purpose. So is there an undersupply of physicians, or, or what do you think it is? I don't think there's an undersupply of physicians. I think it's a maldistribution based on specialty in geography. And I think we've got plenty of physicians, we just need to deploy them differently and more primary care physicians and less cardiologists, less orthopedic surgeons. In the state of Florida, look at all the universities that we have here that have medical schools now and they're producing almost 2,000 students a year coming out of the medical schools. That's a lot of doctors. And where are those doctors gonna go? If they're going into primary care practice, they can, they can really make a difference. So his, I threw this in, this is a card of my cardiologist, who's a wonderful guy, uh, and he says, that he doesn't think that there's an oversupply of at least cardiologists, uh, or an undersupply of cardiologists. And look at all the cardiologists in his group. That's just in Clearwater. So we see this on the ground at every big hospital. There are big groups in orthopedics and cardiology and plastic surgery. And so there's no shortage of specialists in these areas. And the reason there's no shortage of specialists in these areas is because they make two to three times as much as the primary care doctor. And this must be rectified, right? This has to be fixed. Primary care physicians go through the same kind of training that the specialists do, and they should be compensated. We don't, we don't begrudge our specialists making a decent living and all of that, but we have to lift up primary care. We just have to lift up primary care. <clears throat> Mental health needs, and this is where I wanted to talk about psychiatry and what psychiatry can be in primary care practice. Primary, at Centene, we're very much into integrating medical and behavioral practices, and we pay medical behavioral integrated practices more. We provide them with more funding if they are integrated. And um, <clears throat> what we found is that there's a nationwide shortage of child and adult psychiatrists. There's, they can't get in to see a psychiatrist. I did a peer-to-peer -peer the other day with a, a doctor in Eugene, Oregon. She said, we're doing the mental health care because we can't find a psychiatrist that will see the patient. They all, most of the psychiatrists don't take insurance. They, act, they want cash, or they're filled up, they're not taking any more patients, and so uh, primary care physicians are being called upon to do more and more of the mental health care in their community. Um, with two wars raging, climate crisis, gun violence, social media, these are all triggers for people on the edge for people who have serious mental illness, if they're stable and these things are happening, those are the kinds of things that push the person over the edge and they become depressed, psychotic, extremely anxious, and they're gonna end up at your door, at the primary care fam family physician's door. A 2019 study of high school showed, students showed one in three students had persistent feelings of loneliness, sadness, hopelessness, and an increase of 40% from 2009. And globally, depression is the number three cause of disability per the World Health Organization. Mental health crisis in the US is exemplified by over 50,000 suicides in 2023, a rate of 14.3 suicides per 100,000 is the highest it's been since 1941. 75 years of age and older have a rate of 44 per 100,000. And COVID has a big part to play in this, causing isolation, feelings of loneliness, people feeling separated, and then people working from home. I'm working from home now, 
And it's totally different than when I used to go into the office in Tampa and relate with all of my colleagues at work. It's a very isolating, lonely kind of feeling. But you want to remember the five Ds of the elderly, depression, disease, disability, disconnectedness, and deadly, and deadly weapons. So the PCP has a growing role in managing behavioral health conditions. I can tell you that, and there's been many studies that show that primary care physicians, 30% of the people that see a primary care physician do not have a somatic etiology for their complaints, a physical uh, organic etiology for the complaints. They get a workup and it's negative. All the labs are negative, the x-rays are negative. What are those people? They might have depression, anxiety, or a somatoform disorder. I don't know if all of you remember conversion disorders, um, hypochondriasis, polysomatization, chronic pain. Those are all psychogenic pain. Those are all psychiatric conditions you want to think about in that 30% of people that you can't find something wrong. But PCPs are the number one prescriber of antidepressants. PCPs are the number one prescriber of anti-anxiety meds. And PCPs are more and more prescribing antipsychotics because the second generation antipsychotics and the newer antipsychotics are so safe and effective that primary care physicians feel more comfortable using them. And rules around medication-assisted therapies for like uh, substance use disorders are, are relaxing so that primary care physicians can take care of their substance use disorder patients with Suboxone and other drugs like that. So most patients will first see their PCP for their mental health care needs. Studies have shown that patients who have attempted suicide typically saw their PCP within the weeks, months, just before they attempted suicide. So the PCP definitely has a huge role and a growing role in caring for mental health patients. I mentioned medical behavioral homes. Centene is supporting the development of medical behavioral homes. You can get certified as a medical behavioral home if you have behavioral health people working for you in your clinic. This is what we call integrated medical behavioral integration. And studies have shown that there are cost offsets associated with integrated care. Patients go into the hospital less frequently, they're readmitted less frequently, uh, their cost of care comes down. We did a study at Centene and we looked at uh, seriously mentally ill people that were in a medically, behaviorally integrated uh, care uh, place. And what we found is their readmissions were much lower than the non integrated patients, and the patients didn't go into the hospital for medical reasons. People with serious medical illness, serious mental illness, had high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, COPD, but they weren't going into the hospital because they were getting this coordinated care, this integrated care, and their psychiatric care was aiding in their medical care. They could understand the treatments and follow the treatments and so on. So they had reduced levels of medical expense, reduced hospitalizations, and better outcomes. So the medical behavioral home is a, is a new thing, and there are additional payments if you are a medical behavioral home. And I'm happy to tell you that for the students at NOVA, we've developed five clerkship sites at these uh, mental health centers that you see in this list here, Appalachia, Meridian, Peace River, Aspire, and Banyan. And all of those are medical behavioral homes. They have integrated medical care into their psychiatric care. And so these students are getting uh, their clerkship at these places where they see coordinated care. And uh, it's really consistent with our osteopathic philosophy our holistic philosophy. The leader of uh, uh, collaborative care has been the University of Washington. That's where I trained as a resident. I was like one of the first DOs 
that they ever had at the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry. They've had many DOs since that time, but they led the way, they've led the way in developing this collaborative care model, and the collaborative care model is where they have a care manager embedded in a, a primary care practice, and she coordinates the care of all their mental health patients, and she works with an outside psychiatrist, a consulting psychiatrist, who can do a zoom into the, into the clinic, and they review all of the patients that she's following, and that's what they call collaborative care, and they've shown that it's Medi medically effective and that it's cost effective. It reduces medical expense. Uh, and if you want more information about this, just go to the Ames Center at the University of Washington website and they have all sorts of articles and documentation of how this works. Now, I've kind of put this together uh, so that you might see which behavioral health conditions primary care physicians might take care of and which ones you might refer. Like, certainly, primary care physicians would take care of depressive disorders, anxiety, adjustment reactions, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, substance use disorder, marital and family dysfunction, ADHD, uh, the somatoform disorders I mentioned, and even long-acting injectables. Most psychiatrists don't have the wherewithal to be able to give injections in their office. So to partner with a primary care physician to give those injections is, is really a great service to that psychiatrist if you have a collaborative relationship with a psychiatrist. And the conditions you might want to refer are patients who have serious mental illness with repeated hospitalizations, suicidal or homicidal patients, uh, patients with multiple comorbidities, uh, polypharmacy patients, domestic violence patients, uh, personality disorder patients that do self-inflicted injuries or uh, self-abusive, or psychotic patients where non-adherence is uh, seen. Lots of seriously mentally ill patients refuse to take their medicines, they're non-adherent, and they take a lot of time and attention, and they need the uh, continuum of care that a mental health center like Aspire or Henderson or whoever would give. They have PHP, IOP, day treatment, group, uh, they have uh, peer support and all of that within the mental health center. And so those patients are the patients you might want to refer to a mental health center. So this, are, this slide really kind of details the uh, uh, payment model that the Ames Center developed for the University of Washington. And you can see by the dates here that uh, over time, more and more services are being included for payment. Like in the old days when I first started in practice, you could not see a patient for a medical condition and a behavioral health condition on the same day. And now that's gone. You can treat uh, a medical problem and a behavioral health problem and bill for those services on the same day. Um, the psychiatrist and the physician get paid through the traditional fee-for-service, but indirect services, like if you have a care manager, if you hire a care manager to manage your behavioral health cases, they can charge for 130 minutes the first month and 120 minutes in subsequent months. So they can bill for those services. And there are other services that they can bill for, and it's all on the Ames Center link. So I just want to mention, I think there's a broader role for primary care, and especially osteopathic physicians. And I hope this happens. I don't know if it will or not. But I think that primary care physicians should reclaim their role in the hospital. Primary care physicians, when I first started in practice, they essentially ran the hospital. They had all the patients, and they selected the specialists that they wanted the patient to see. They handpicked the specialist, and they matched the patient with the specialist for the best outcomes, right? And uh, they would go into the hospital and make rounds on the patient. 
And for me as a patient, an inpatient, when I was an inpatient, I would have preferred to see my primary care physician rather than see a hospitalist that I didn't know. And they monitor the care the patient gets. They're the point person for speaking with the family. The family feels reassured when they see the primary care physician in there. And most importantly, the primary care physician develops the discharge plan. One of the big issues with our health plan, like Centene, is the gap between discharge and outpatient. And the patients get lost, Medicaid patients especially. But all patients, there's that gap. And the primary care physician can fill that gap. They're, the best, they're in the best position to get that person into an outpatient plan and to make sure they follow up with their uh, referrals. So they should be leading the effort to coordinate discharge planning and follow up. And then in the old days when I first started in practice, they were on all the committees, quality committee, executive committee, credentials committee, have a huge influence on the hospital and the direction of the hospital. But nobody is better positioned to manage the patient than the primary care physician who knows the patient as an outpatient, knows what they're capable of, knows what their baseline level of functioning is, right? And when they come in the hospital, they're probably at their worst, not their best. And so the primary care physician sees them through the worst along with a specialist, cardiologist, whoever else has been chosen to participate in their care by the primary care physician. And then when the patient leaves the hospital, the doctor is aware of it. How many of you have had patients go into the hospital and come out of the hospital and you never knew they were there? That is not a good uh, patient experience. So the PCP is a single person who can provide true continuity of care for patients, true continuity of care, lead the discharge planning process with the goals of discharge planning to be an outpatient visit with seven, within seven days, which is a quality metric, right? Reduce seven and 30 day readmission rates. You're reducing the cost of care. The insurance companies will love you. Increase pa patient satisfaction. The patients and the families would prefer to see you than to see some stranger hospitalist person. And re you're reducing medical expense through this whole thing. And while you're in the hospital making rounds, your nurse practitioners, physician assistants, your social workers, psychologists, and uh, care managers are the team that's t taking care of your outpatients for you in a coordinated, team-based approach. Now, to just talk a little bit about burnout for physicians. Uh, a primary care physician needs diversity in his practice. If you're in a primary care practice, you're employed, and you're working eight to five, and you're seeing 50 patients a day, that is uh, a recipe for disaster and burnout, right? It's it just gonna happen. Autonomy is good for burnout. Being in control of your life and your environment is good for burnout. Diversifying your practice so you're seeing some people outside of your office. Maybe you're going, doing some consulting for a healthcare organization in your area or something like that. Getting out of the office, relating with the specialists in the hospital is an antidote to burnout. Every day that you go into the hospital is CME for you. You're working with your specialists, you're absorbing information. We didn't have doctors complaining of burnout 20 years ago or 30 years ago. <clears throat> Consulting for other human uh, service-related organizations in your community. Owning your own business. Setting your own schedule, pace, vacation, CME. Being in control is the way you avoid burnout. Hiring your own staff and medical team. 
And I, I'm only bringing these things up because I've been talking to all these students that are applying to med school and these students that are on our third year clerkship, going through the clerkship experience, and they're asking these questions. And that's what brought all this to mind. And what's life gonna be like for them as primary care physicians, if 50 or 60% of them go into primary care? And I think it's up to you, all of us, to set the stage for them to have a better existence than we've had ourselves, right? It's time for all of us to stand up and speak out and to help these students to have a better professional life and personal life than maybe we've had. The next generation of osteopathic physicians, osteopathic medical schools should be required to have a family practice department. Many of them don't. Medical education experience should be holistic, keeping our osteopathic philosophy and traditions intact, mind, body, and spirit, with a greater emphasis and more time spent on mental health, social determinants of health, as well as biomedical issues consistent with our osteopathic principles. More community-based training. Like, uh, I'm really happy to tell you that psychiatry residents are now going to these community mental health centers and rotating through these community mental health centers. Back in the day when I was a resident, they stayed in the ivory towers of the university hospitals, like University of Michigan. You stay right there, you never venture outside. But now they're going to the community mental health centers in their various counties, and they're getting a real experience. This is what real life's like. This is where students are actually, this is where patients are residing at these mental health centers, and you have to work with the communities and the resources that are available. I hope and pray, and many of you may know more about this than I do, is the ACGME PGY one year gonna include a full 12 month rotating internship? How many of you took a rotating internship? I did. You did pediatrics, I delivered 50 babies I think when I was an intern, I've never forgotten it. These are things you never forget, these experiences of medicine, surgery, pediatrics, um, it's the foundation of what our osteopathic uh, philosophy is. A return to private practice where physicians are truly autonomous, independent, separate from the hospital, you know, and make decisions based on patients' best, you know, patients' interest, not the hospital's interest. Uh, compensation solutions that don't discourage students from going into primary care has to be addressed. And uh, all of you, if you advocate in a state legislature for Medicaid payments that reimburse primary care to a greater extent, that's what we need. Health plans like Centene, like my company, and just to tell you a little bit about my company, we, we manage 23 million people over the 50 states. We have 63,000 employees, if you can imagine that. And the revenues of Centene are like $130 billion. So it's a big organization. The, the contract for seriously mentally ill patients in Florida was $1.1 billion, and we won the entire bid. So we were responsible for over 130,000 people with serious mental illness. But the Centene is willing to work with providers to develop compensation models where they share the savings with the provider. It's called shared savings. So if you figure out a way to reduce readmissions of a seriously mentally ill patient population, they're willing to share that savings with you. And all the health plans are doing this. They're trying to be really innovative in how they approach compensation. So, what do you tell DO applicants and students? This is what I'm telling them. Go into primary care in the tradition of osteopathic medicine. Expand your role in BH through collaborative or integrated models. 
Own your own practice. Be your own boss. Build a team of support around you, including BH clinicians, so you don't burn out. Go back into the hospital and assert your role as the personal physician of the patient. Direct the care of the patient. Communicate with the treatment team. Communicate with the family. Be the point person for the family communication. And be in charge of that transition from inpatient to outpatient or outpatient to inpatient. You're in charge of that. Lead the discharge planning process and be the expert in free services in the community. You know your community, know the resources in your community, know what's available for your patient, and be the expert on that. Because those are the social determinants that we're dealing with, and the physician has to know about those things now. So that's my talk, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. I think this may be my swan song. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm just about done, maybe in a couple of years, and uh, uh, I've been proud to be a DO, and I'm really thankful to uh, speak to you today. Thank you.